Welcome to Vanderbilt Libraries. We're here today in the Poetry Room to talk about book lows with one of our students. Um, Jacob will introduce himself in a second, but I'd like to introduce the series. Um, book Love came from an idea by writer Laura Miller, uh, who started Salon. And she wrote that the first book we fall in love with affects us every bit as much as the first person we fall in love with. I'm interested in exploring that emotional attachment that everyone has to books that they've loved. And so Jacob is going to share with us uh, a little bit about what his book loves are. And first, can you tell us how you, how you got to the library, Jacob? Sure. Um, my name is Jacob Schroeder, and I'm an economics and history major here at Vanderbilt. And I kind of stumbled across the special collections. I'm currently a Buchanan Fellow, but long before that, I have been the digital media editor of the Vanderbilt Historical Review. I really got to learn a lot about the history of the school, got to discover a lot about the library, and so that's connected me with this program. I'm really excited to be here for that. So. Well, thank you. Um, what was the first book you fell in love with? So that's, that's actually a really good question because I read a variety of books as a kid that I wouldn't say one single book had a huge soul impact on me, but there were definitely a few that were really, really important. The first like series that really impacted me was actually The 39 Clues, which is an interesting book because it's like a scavenger hunt that these kids go on throughout the world. They have this crazy, powerful family that's got tons of famous people connected with it, and it covers a lot of historical topics that I found really interesting. And the reason why it made such an impact on me is at the time I was working as a reporter for the Scholastic News Kids Press Corps. I was actually their youngest kid journalist. And so they gave me a first edition copy of it before it even came out of the very first book. And I was thrilled to even get like a set of cards in the book. I started collecting the cards. Um, then I just really got into that series, but I think being a reporter in Scholastic also connected me with a lot of other Scholastic books and authors. Um, one of the other books that I thought was really interesting was the Magic Treehouse series. So when I was in, um, I think it was first grade or kindergarten, I was privileged enough to be reading at a pretty advanced level. And I remember one of the first times I got to read up on the fourth or fifth grade shelf was this book on the Titanic. It was a Magic Treehouse book. And I think that was one of the, I already always had a passion for history, but I think this book really inspired me to deep, dig deep. And I think I was a Titanic history buff for a good three, four years of elementary school. And uh, I would drag my parents to some like Titanic exhibit when it traveled around to where we were. And then going into this whole theme of books that kind of were parts of series, Hardy Boys, great ones, uh, but one thing that I would do is I would cheat, and I would just flip to the end of the book and kind of get because they were all very formulaic, and I think I was just really interested in what the, the book was, was going to be about, who, who it was, and so I collected tons of Hardy Boy books, I think I had like a hundred of them. Uh, and then once I got to middle school, the biggest influences on me, I think was the same with everyone my age, is the Harry Potter books, Hunger Games. Maze Runner, Percy Jackson, just all those like typical series that are really magical. But I think what's what's interesting about them is um, not only how well they connect with readers, but sometimes these books can really teach historical topics that are harder to access if you're if you're a young kid. Um, in fact, I'd say a lot of these history books. Oh, there's there's another one where it's the Who They Were series biopics, and so they've got just kind of a kid-friendly biography of these, these uh, famous people. And I also started to collect atlases of wars when I was a kid. So I was really into the Civil War, and so I got this book that was the Atlas of the Civil War. And it had all these battles with these little squares and squiggly lines of the different battle formations at Shiloh or Chattanooga, and I thought that was just fascinating. So I think all these books really inspired me to go in the direction of history as well, just because of their themes. Have you reread any of the, you know, you've probably reread Harry Potter, but say Percy Jackson. So I'm actually not. Titanic or any of these books. I'm not the biggest rereader, and that kind of goes with I'm not the biggest rewatcher of movies, because once I get the plot of the movie, once I get the movie, I like, there's only so much time I have in my life, so I want to try to like explore as many possible books and themes. However, However, when I was a kid, I read this book that I thought was hilarious 
uh, I don't know how old I was, maybe nine or 10, it was the kid who ran for president. And I read it, I don't, re I don't remember when it came out, but I reread that one two or three times, and I think that was one of the few books I ever reread. And then um, if you're talking more currently, like if I reread a book more currently, which we'll get to a little bit more in detail, but in middle school, my dad told me about this book called Jonathan Livingston Siegel. It's by Richard Bach, which I have this book right here I've been holding. It's related a lot to Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Richard Bach is just an incredible author. Um, and what the bigger theme, and I'll again get into more detail of Jonathan Livingston Siegel in a bit, but the bigger theme is just you can carve out your own destiny. Perfection isn't necessarily achievable. You can always keep growing as a person, but it's important not to get tossed in with the flock. It's important to you know, find your own true meaning, find your own motivations, and be an independent thinker. And so I really got those messages from that book. And I got to reread it this summer, and I was going through a really rough personal time, and there were lots of themes that seemed to connect with my current life. And we were off on a uh, cabin trip in the middle of nowhere. Um, the cabin had no internet, no Wi-Fi. So I reread Jonathan Livingston Siegel, I think two or three times actually, on this cabin retreat with my family. And it just was incredibly interesting to see how much it had actually impacted me in the five or six years in between the last time I had read it. Um, there were just so many outlooks on life that I had been able to kind of have in the background of my mind. This independent thinker, this drive for perfection that's just not achievable. And then I also saw some really interesting religious allegories in the end that didn't necessarily stand out to me when I was in middle school and I didn't have as deep of a knowledge on theological studies. So it was just really interesting to kind of get not only this view of how it had already impacted me, but to get some more clues and information out of the book that is really not a large novel. Is, is there a book that besides Jonathan Livingston Siegel that captured your imagination before college? Then? Before college? Another one that Capture my imagination in a completely different way would be um, extremely loud and incredibly close. And so it's basically about a boy who has autism. His father was uh, lost in 9-11 and the attacks on 9-11. And his dad liked to kind of set out these scavenger hunts for his, for his son. And his son unfortunately didn't, maybe thought that these scavenger hunts were bigger than they really were. It was less of a father-son bonding and that his son actually had the secrets to the city. And he ends up going on this crazy scavenger hunt where he goes and meets lots of unique people along the way. And it's a big personal growth story for him. And so I thought that was like really, really, not only really, really sad, but it was also really interesting how gripping it was. And I hadn't, as a kid, read a lot of books that were as heavy as that. But I thought that was a really interesting book. Another one that was less heavy, but also captured my imagination before college is I'm from Portland, Oregon. And we have some really amazing parks, including Forest Park. And love the hiking there. And when you go from these big skyscrapers and literally 10, 15 minute walk up the hill into the middle of the woods, um, it's a magical kind of transcended experience. And so there's a book called Wildwood which I got to read. And it's kind of based on this trail called the Wildwood Trail, which stretches across forest parks. And if you don't know Portland, Portland actually, I think, has the most park space of any US city. And Wildwood just crosses through that. So kind of like Narnia, this book, you go and there's these kids and none of the adults go into, into the forest park in the book. These kids end up wandering in and there is a civil war brewing between different animal species in different parts of the forest park kingdom. And as a kid, I had just, I had just moved to Portland. I didn't really understand that forest park was as big as it really was until I actually got to hiking when I was older. So I was like, why are there so many countries in this park in Portland, uh, in this book? But I thought it was just so interesting that this author was able to capture the spirit of our city into a book that was just had this magical realism to it. It was very much like um, reading Narnia, but tailored to my city. So I thought that was a really cool book. That's great. Is there a book that specifically set you on your desire to study history? And what impressed you about it? So 
Well, um, going back a little bit to, you know, the 39 Clues, if I was to talk about, like, a book that was a fiction novel that made me really think it was kind of like national treasure. We're going to discover some secrets in the archives of these buildings. But I think um, a no single book necessarily inspired me to be a historian, but I had a lot of family members, including my grandfather, who just collect, he had a huge personal library collection of old books and he loved history and sharing that passion with me and so I would always go to museums enthusiastically as a kid and I think that led me to collecting some of the, the war books I was talking about earlier. I, would, I remember I was at Barnes & Noble with my mom and I was haggling with her how much allowance I could get extra so I could buy these military history books on uh, the Middle Ages warfare or uh, warfare in the Civil War, World War II. And so I wouldn't say there was any one novel, maybe in the series of 39 Clues for talking uh, fiction novel, but some of these nonfiction novels I always found fascinating to see some of these battle strategies laid out and I would play with my little army soldiers and set up a reenactment of Gettysburg or Antietam and I just thought that was fascinating. Um, and so even though war history isn't necessarily something I specialize in now, now as a history econ student, um, I've been, I guess it is war studies technically, but it's more Cold War international relations is something I've been studying a lot. And sure, it's not the same battle plans, but I find it really interesting to get these connections from what I found really passionate about when I was a kid. Is there a book that you share with friends, family? Workers. And so that's what I'm going to get to now. I actually had to even bring it to even bring it today. I had to get it back from my friend who was packing it in his luggage for uh, Thanksgiving break. Uh, but Illusions is the one that I think is the best right now. Um, so after reading Jonathan Livingston Siegel this summer, um, I was just blown away with not only how much it impacted me, but I thought it was just so beautifully written. And, and so if you don't know what Jonathan Livingston Seagull is, it is about a seagull. And the seagull finds self-actualization um, by learning to love to fly. So whereas most seagulls, they go peck for food on the beach, um, Jonathan Livingston Seagull is trying to become the fastest, most dynamic flyer out there. And he is ostracized by the group for pursuing this passion. And so he ends up learning to fly out on the cliffs and um, I'm not entirely sure based off the writing, but I think he dies a few times in, in his ascension to um, a higher, higher place. He ends up discovering more and more ways to fly, and he eventually gets to the point where he can, it's not because he's superhuman or super bird, he's able to transport himself from location to location instantly, just at will. And so what I thought was so interesting about that is, sure, it's, it's not, you can't transport yourself, instantly to other places, but it's just unlocking the potential of the mind. Like, if you truly believe you can't do that, you can't do that. And so, when he was able to overcome I can't, he was able to go achieve things that most birds couldn't do. And most birds thought that he was some sort of super being or some higher power, some holy creature. And in fact, he had just been able to achieve so much because of a different mindset, different outlook. So um, I actually got to pitch this book to, um, I'm part of the Curb Scholars program and we use this as our book club book um, over the summer. And uh, the former director of the Curb Scholars program, Elizabeth Meadows, absolutely amazing. She was a huge fan of Jonathan Livingston Seagull and she was like, okay, since you love this book so much, you've got to check out Illusions. And it's also by Richard Bach. And it's not exactly the sequel, but it carries some of the themes into a book that pairs very well with John Lewis and Siegel. So I bought it immediately um, and I dove right into it right as I was uh, flying over here um, for, to start my, my sophomore year of, of college. And it was such an impactful book. Um, she believes that it's better than Jonathan Lewis and Siegel. I don't know if there's anything that could beat that book. So I'm reluctant to say this book is better. But put together, they make some of the best readings possible. And so the reason why I like to recommend it to friends and family, and the reason why I um, reread these books when I don't normally reread books, is the messages in it are applicable to everything you do in life. And it's 
so so it's called illusions because they the idea of the book is everything is an illusion including limitations if you truly actualize something that is your dream like you can make it happen you don't like as long as you believe in it you can make it happen can you tell me about a gift book you remember gift book i remember um I think uh, one of the coolest books that I was given as a gift is this um, one called House of the Scorpion. And so I was given it by my cousin, uh, Camille. Thank you, Camille. And I think I was maybe 10, 11, sometime in middle school. And it's basically this book about cloning, but it mixes it with some concepts on illegal immigration and um, it's got it's basically set in the future but it's in mexico and there's a wealthy drug lord who has uh clones of himself made for just replaceable body parts and it's really disturbing in that sense but um right now i'm actually taking a class on genetic modification on it's called superhuman civilizations with uh, professor michael bess and it's interesting to kind of look back on this book and see some of the connections with the modern day it brings in. It is actually a children's book. Um, it's for teens. And I thought it was really interesting just how well it can dive into some political allegories, but also touch on some of these modern issues of genetic modification, cloning, um, drug crises. And so that was just really interesting. There's some class issues. And so it dives into some really heavy topics but in the form of something really palatable for kids and teens. What are you reading now? I'm reading now. Um, well, actually, that book that I was just talking about, my professor, uh, Professor Michael Bess, wrote this really, really interesting, it was totally worth a read, it's not a textbook, it's a novel, I would say, um, called Make Way for the Superhumans. That's the UK title, there's, a, there's another title in the US, and um, it is, fascinating because as I was talking about before with the House of the Scorpion, it talks about some of the ethics of cloning, some of the class issues of genetic modification. So um, one thing that a lot of people are going to have to deal with in society is we're going to start getting cognitive and uh, epigenetic enhancers. And so what this means is you can take a pill and if you're feeling down, you'll be happy. You'll take this pill and there are going to be very few side effects and it's going to be very few side effects, so it's going to be available on an aggregate scale. That means you can go just to a, to a supermarket, to CVS, and get pills that can truly affect your mind easily, like this. And so there's some serious dangers with that. I'd love to read it. What three writers would you invite to dinner? And so this, this is a really tough question. Uh, I first of all have to do Richard Bach. Um, I would have to bring him back to life, unfortunately. Um, but just he has had such an impact on me today. I would love to be able to talk with him. Um, although it'd be nice to have three authors that like all could have a conversation together that would build on each other. Um, I'm gonna have to kind of put seat Bach over to the side over here to talk with me, and then put the other two authors over here. I would like to meet Bao Nin and Tim O'Brien. So last year I took a course on the Vietnam War with Professor Thomas Schwartz. Um, one of my favorite classes of all time. And if you watch the Ken Burns Vietnam War documentary, there are these two authors. One is a former Vietnam, Vietnamese soldier from North Vietnam. Um, the other is an American veteran. And they both have gone on to become prolific authors on the Vietnam War and non nonfiction, but more of a fiction writer. Uh, and they were both featured in the documentary, actually adjacent to each other which might not be a coincidence because a lot of their writing seems to reflect each other's. It seems like they're probably familiar with each other's works, even though there's no information online as to whether or not that's true. So that would be really interesting to have them discuss. Bao Nin wrote this book called The Sorrow of War. And I don't know if there's a book that tore me up more than this. And obviously, I guess, what was I expecting? It's called Sorrow of War. Um, but it is really sad. and. At the same time, though, it's beautifully written. I don't think there's another book on war that really captures the experience of a civilian, of soldiers. And what's also really interesting is it's coming from the other side. So it's coming from the North Vietnamese soldiers. So I think it, there's some empathy that the book builds if you can kind of identify the struggles of what they're going through. And it's not necessarily 
that this, it, well, another interesting thing from Bao Nin's perspective is it's not anti-American. It's not, man, I'm just so upset that these Americans came into Vietnam and killed us and we have this war. It's more this, this I guess, nihilistic anti-war feeling, but also this anti-government feeling of feeling some discontent with the, the North Vietnamese government that just kept perpetuating the war that I think shared a lot of the disconnect with Tim O'Brien who has a lot of discontent with what the American government was doing. So I thought there were some interesting parallels of these two soldiers that both didn't want to be in this war, they didn't necessarily have direct hatred for each other, it was more just hatred and disgust with war. And so I think it would just be really interesting to have the two of them talk over here, have a good conversation with them a little bit, talk with Richard Bach about you know, self-actualization, I think that would be a really interesting dinner. Sounds like a great dinner. Um, what are you going to read next? That's a good question. I've gotten some really good recommendations, so I'm going to have to kind of jump around. Uh, one of the books that I haven't gotten to read yet, but I have it, is also part of this Vietnam War class. There was a Vanderbilt, he occasionally teaches here, his name's David Marinus, and he is both a sports writer, but also a Vietnam War historian. And he has this book called They Marched Into, and then they marched into sunlight. And um, they actually made a documentary called Five Days in October, which I'd say is one of the greatest documentaries I've ever seen. Um, I actually got to watch it twice, one of which David Marinus was there. And I got a copy of his book that he signed for me. That was really, really cool. And I haven't read that copy yet. I would love to dive into it. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you for sharing your book clubs, Jacob. Thank you for having I'm me. I'm Marianne Caton, and this is Vanderbilt Library's Book Club. <laughs>